Greetings, grappling fans. Everything stopped at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. Daddy was the biggest name Great Britain ever produced. Wrestling in England is completely gone. I remember that being off. Wolfie. Probably the worst item ever. I honestly thought, this is it. That was really the start of when people started to take notes again. There's so many talented people and entertaining people in this country. I watched all the British talent wrestle. Oh God, it's so much better than what I'm used to seeing. We have to have something unique about us, otherwise we're just imitating Americans. In 1955, independent television launched in the UK. In contrast to its counterpart, the BBC, which had been the sole broadcaster for 23 years, ITV introduced a schedule featuring game shows, soap opera, and professional wrestling. Responsible for producing the wrestling on the channel was a newly formed alliance of companies called Joint Promotions. The idea of Joint Promotions was to work together to have sort of a single booking office for the main stars and also to unite against the independent smaller promoters who are trying to get into their towns and ultimately uh, this allowed them to get the TV contract. Bouts were conducted under Mount Evans rules. The guidelines introduced by former Olympic wrestler Norman Morell and endorsed by major political figure and longtime wrestling fan Admiral Lord Mount Evans were an attempt to clean up professional wrestling, which had fallen into disrepute prior to the Second World War through the rise of an overly violent, all in style. We had lightweights, we had middleweights, we had heavy middleweights, we had light heavyweights. Two falls, two submissions, or a knockout. There were rounds as well, and men with a bucket and the ding ding, end of round one, like boxing. These Mount Evans rules really gave a lot of credibility to the, the business and made it look more of a legitimate above board sport, which then sort of served as the, the basis for promoting. It was viewed differently by the public, you know? And if you look at some of the old photographs and the old footage from the olden days, you know, people are in their Sunday best. You know, people are dressed with shirt and tie, and it's for them a real night out. By 1960, a weekly television slot provided the perfect platform for wrestlers such as Mick McManus and Jackie Palo to become household names. Palo had the ponytail, which at the time, there weren't that many men with a ponytail and wore striped trunks. McManus was more kind of a tough guy. He was like the guy you were scared of in the pub. Palo always said the key to the feud was that the fans could have great fun deciding which one they hated the most. With great public interest, the two would headline both the 1962 and 63 FA Cup final day wrestling specials. More people watch Dad and Mick's fight than watch the cup final that followed it. You have to sit down with a cup of tea and a Mary biscuit. It's just incredible to think that that, that happened. In 1965, ITV debuted a new sports show, World of Sport, and pro wrestling had a new home. Back then it was three channels, so it was a huge thing to be on television. Les Kellett, great Yorkshireman, who played comedy as wrestling, he'd pretend to be hit and he'd, he'd act stunned, he'd get the audiences laughing. John Cortez, who to this day, I couldn't tell you a better wrestler than him. If you look back in the, the 60s, there was proper, proper individualism, but all these fellas could wrestle. It was like a great British tradition almost that Saturday afternoon, four o'clock, you knew where everybody was, they were watching the wrestling on ITV. Supermarkets closed at three o'clock on, on a Saturday afternoon because every, the, the high street was deserted. You know, that, that, those are f true facts. Everybody rushed home to, to watch wrestling. It was a comforting thing, Saturday afternoons, with Kent Walton saying, greetings, grappling fans from the Halifax Civic Baths. Whether they liked it or not, they watched it, they had a laugh. They knocked it, they enjoyed it, it was always on. And that's why we had so many shows going on all over the country, because television didn't half do a great deal of good for our business. However, by the mid-1970s, and with an ageing talent pool, wrestling's popularity started to wane. In an attempt to revive the industry, former wrestler come promoter Max Crabtree 
took charge of joint promotions in 1975. Max Crabtree, he was a, an absolute genius. The man could take someone and within two or three shows transform them into a household name. Having made his TV debut in 1971, the mysterious masked wrestler Kendo Nagasaki shot to stardom under the supervision of Max Crabtree. Kendo Nagasaki had a charisma. He had something about him, that personality or or that persona. If you could sum him up in two words, consummate professional, right well, whatever he did before, during, after. Max Crabtree's brother, Shirley, who had wrestled as the battling guardsman, was rebranded as Big Daddy and formed a formidable tag team with six foot eleven giant haystacks. Haystacks was either loved or he was hated, and he was just such a massive individual. I mean, people, you know, if you'd seen him walk into the crowd, people would just, you know, they'd be standing there with their mouths open, they'd be gobsmacked because, they, you know, you've just never seen anything like that. And I think it was that, uh, it was that over the topness that, that really set him apart. By the late 1970s, the hard hitting Mark Rollerball Rocco found himself embroiled in fierce competition with fellow heavy middleweight Marty Jones. He was hell of a craftsman in the ring, but when everybody says Rocco was a great wrestler, he wasn't only a great wrestler, he was a good, um, we call him a heel in the business. And a heel has got to go on with a baby face. And I'll tell you this now, we used to not crap out of each other. Mark was a one-off in our day. He was ahead of his time. He wrestled in our ilk, in the British way of wrestling, but like the Americans do now, so he was well ahead of his time, Mark. His dad was a brilliant, brilliant wrestler. His dad was Jumping Jim Hussey. Mark learns everything probably from his dad, uh, and he was different. Another heavy middleweight to emerge in the 1970s was a young Ulsterman by the name of Dave Fit Finlay. If I have to say I look up to anybody in this sport at all, it would be Dave Fit Finley because Dave Finley is one of the most talented professional wrestlers I've ever seen. When the two of us clashed, we both wanted to be number one. And before I knew it, the TV were actually picking this up. There's a feud between these guys. And we was actually taking over the McManus and Palo era. By the end of the decade, Brian Dixon's all-star wrestling had risen to prominence through its promotion of female wrestlers. With Brian's then girlfriend, Mitzi Muller, as the headline act, the company not only grabbed the attention of the fans, but also some of the top talent in joint promotions. And because I was offering a better fee to be on my shows, they would leave the joint promotion circuit and, and come with me. To combat this increased competition, Max Crabtree made his brother Shirley the face of joint promotions. It was a move that proved hugely successful. Max Crabtree had a, had a product with Big Daddy that he knew he had the, the, the control of, and it's a product that, that works. So, so Big Daddy was his bread and butter. Daddy was the, was the biggest name that Great Britain ever produced, bar none. Big Daddy was an household name. Bless him, if Big Daddy was here now, he could walk into my pub and he'd say, oh, that's Big Daddy, he was well known. If I wrestled until I'm 200 years of age, he's still gonna be a bigger name than Robbie Brookside. Surely he had two moves. One of them was terrible. We were looked upon as something a bit special. One person making a decision on behalf of millions. He threw up a flare to the next generation. 